What's up, guys? My name is Marcus Huskins, and thank you for joining me. As always, if you're enjoying this content, please do me a favor and hit that subscribe button, and I appreciate your support. Moving right along, in today's video, we are going to tackle the IR Maker. Over the last three weeks, I've been making an effort to cover some of the more mystical parts of Studio One. The IR Maker is a utility plugin that ships with Studio One. It's getting a little long in the tooth at this point. I think it's due for a GUI refresh, but it still does exactly what we need it to do with respect to working with impulse responses. So impulse responses, we can create them for either Empire or open air. In today's video, we are going to be covering an impulse response for open air because I don't actually have the equipment needed to properly capture a cabinet impulse response. So first things first, let's take a look at our session. I have uh, two tracks pulled up here. In one of these tracks, I basically have a kick drum sample, and this will be to test the impulse response after we create it. The first track has the IR maker on it. This is a stereo track that I've pulled up. If we open up our IO setup, it's worth noting that I already have my inputs and outputs set up and named accordingly. Uh, so my input is Elisa Stereo Return, and my output is Elisa Stereo Send. The impulse response that we are going to be grabbing today is going to come from the Elisa MIDI Verb 4. Now, before we get too far along, a couple things that I want to point out. First of all, when you're connecting to any hardware, you definitely want to do a little bit of research to make sure that you're connecting at the proper level. So for example, we have minus 10 and we have plus 4. Now, on most interfaces, if I show my launcher and I go to my quantum tab, you have this option somewhere with your inputs, for example, where you can toggle between minus 10, which would be unbalanced, and plus four. So these operate at a different impedance level. And this is something that you want to make sure you have a look at before. Now, that being said, I'm actually breaking the rules here because I'm going to be using the quantum 4848 today because all of my inputs and outputs are taken on my main quantum, and I actually have my external effects processor connected to input and output one and two on my 4848. Now the 4848 is a professional line level interface, and it's designed to work with professional balanced level equipment. So currently we don't have an option to choose minus 10, so I'm going to have to compensate for that in the output of the level that I'm sending when I do my sweep, more on that later. But that's just something that I wanted to point out. Secondly, if you want any detailed information, you definitely want to open up your help menu. And if we go into here and we type in IR maker under the metering analysis and signal generation, you will find detailed information on the IR maker. Pay specific attention to points four and point seven. They're useful information, but we're going to be covering the majority of this in this video. So I've already set up my inputs and outputs. Our first step is that you want to set your input to the return of your effects processor. And I've named this accordingly so it's easy for me to do. And then our send or output, you want to make sure that you've set that properly. So now the input and the output of this actual track where the IR maker is, is set to receive and send from the effects processor. Now the next step is we need to do the latency compensation. Now the basic idea here is you want to do a loopback from your interface and back into your interface and you can detect the latency. Now, I've done two separate tests. I've done one where I did a straight loop back and it gave me a figure, one figure, and then I did another where I basically bypassed my effects processor and it gave me another figure that was slightly higher, about 20 samples more latency. And I have a feeling that that has to do with the fact that my hardware effects processor has its own A to D and D to A converters built in. So I'm doing this latency compensation with my effects processor in line, but bypassed. So if you go to choose the detect option right now, you'll notice that we saw this ping over here, but it says that you have a level of minus 144 and it needs to be at least minus 30. Click OK. The way to get over this is you want to make sure that this track is monitor enabled. And then I'm double checking that my effects processor is bypassed, which it is. And now I can click the detect option. So it has detected the latency compensation of 1326. Before I forget, I'm going to make sure that I unbypass my effects processor. One second. Okay, so I've taken the MIDI verb 4 out of bypass, so now we're good to go. A couple things I want to make note of over here. First of all, I would recommend clicking the show option. What this is going to do is it's going to open either a finder window or an explorer window the minute you've recorded your impulse response so that you don't have to go searching for it. 
The second thing that I'm going to do, because I'm using unbalanced equipment with balanced levels, I'm gonna click this normalize option. So this brings it to the maximum level. And then I can adjust in open air if I need to back it down a little bit. I'm going to leave the sweep length and the IR length at its default positions, which is 30 seconds and five seconds. But like I said, this is something where, depending on what you're doing, you definitely wanna read the information in 0.7, because this talks about uh, the IR length being shortened or longer depending on what you want to do uh, but for this case we are good to just go with the default settings now next up this is automatically going to create a folder actually two folders the minute you record your very first impulse response so if I open up this finder window over here you will notice that in studio one documents studio one impulse responses we have this folder that's created we also have a folder called my device that's created i've done a couple of these already so you see we have some impulse responses that are already in this folder if you don't have this folder structure don't worry about it because studio one will create this the minute you create your first impulse response now i'm going to give this a name i'm going to just peek over and i'm going to copy the name that's on my elisa so i could also copy i could even copy the full name, I could say user 23 foiled, and maybe I'll just give this a space. This is up to you in terms of how much, how you want to name your impulse response, um, up to you, completely up to you. Another thing that we can do is if you don't want to have a folder that's my device, let's say I wanted to make an actual folder that was the name of the effects processor that I'm doing, I could click enter folder, or what did this say, enter model folder, and then I could type in something completely different. So I could type in Alesis or Yamaha or Procasti or whatever it is that you're capturing impulse responses from. Let's keep things simple, leave this set to my device. All right, now, if you recall, I mentioned that I'm using balanced line level out with an unbalanced piece of gear. What that means is that I would be clipping the inputs like crazy on my effects processor. So in order to kind of mitigate this, let's open up our inputs and outputs. This will allow us to monitor the input level and the output level that's being sent. I've actually turned this down minus 22 dBs and I've already done a quick test in terms of gain staging. And this move here of turning down the level I'm sending to my effects processor is preventing me from clipping my inputs on the effects processor. Now, if you click start recording, you'll see that we have the levels that are coming in. You can also see it's monitoring here. And this is a good opportunity for you to kind of fine tune things. But I've already chosen the option to normalize and I know this isn't going to be coming in as hot as I would like it to, but we're going to normalize this so I'm not too worried about it. So now that we've set the latency compensation, we set the path, we gave it a name, we chose the option to show and to normalize. I'm just going to let this impulse creation process complete. And then as you can see, it's done here. And then it takes another couple seconds to kind of finish calculating everything. And then when it's done, boom, it brings us to a finder window that it is automatically opened up. Again, impulse response is my device and user 23 dash foiled. This is a name according to the preset in terms of the program patch. Now, the next step is let's go back to Studio One for a moment. We can close this. Actually, let's deactivate our monitoring. We can deactivate the plugin as well. We need to instantiate an instance of open air and we want to go with the default where it has nothing loaded in. Let's move this off to the side a little bit. We'll go back to our finder window or an explorer window if you're on a PC. I will switch my focus to Studio One. We will drag and drop this impulse response in here. And now this is automatically loaded this reverb. And this would be instantly usable right now. This is on the actual track versus ascend. Let's have a quick play and we'll have a listen to it. Okay, so this is using the dry wet blend or the mix. If I bring this down, it's dry. If I bring it up to say somewhere around 50, so now from here, we normalized this impulse response. So one thing that I could do to get this to be a little bit more usable for me, at the default of 20, I would like that to be more subtle. And if this is default to around the minus 12 mark, which is where it was, that's a little too much. So I could actually bring this output down. We can double click in here and enter an exact figure. I've brought this down by minus 18. Let's see what this sounds like. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to say that I'm happy with that. The next step would be saving a preset. 
If you are recording impulse responses and they're automatically going into this specific location, I would advise that if you're capturing impulse responses, just leave these alone, don't move them, and then any presets you create, they will be good for any future sessions. So what I'm going to do is we can actually store a preset so that this can be recalled. So the last step is we wanna choose this option to store a preset. Now we can give it a name. I would like the name to somehow match what's on my Alesis. So I actually have in my preview, I have the program patch available. So this is what I'm using. It's called foiled and it's, and here would be the description. So we can go back to studio one and I say, okay, I could call this foiled. And then for the description, let's see if we can copy and paste this directly from here and I'll command C. No, I am not allowed to copy and paste that. So small, bright plate, great on guitar and organ. I can actually enter this preset or this description, small, bright plate, great on guitar and organ. Now I can choose to give it a subfolder. So I could choose any one of these subfolders that are already there, but I would actually rather create my own and I already have done that. I'm going to put this in Alesis MIDI verb four and it's going to be foiled. Another thing I could do if I wanted these to show up in the same order, I could put the actual number similar to the way I did in my actual impulse response name. And that, again, that is completely up to you in terms of how you want to organize things. So user 23 foiled, we gave it a description, we put it in a subfolder and we can click okay. And now you'll see that in my subfolder or in my folder, or at least this MIDI verb four, this is now available for recall. I have some other ones that are available for recall as well, but I could now recall this. Now what that means, let's just get rid of this for a moment, is that if we're in our effects tab and we scroll to open air, you can see that user 23 foiled, that's available. If I drag this into the send, it will now open up an instance of open air. And because it's on an effects channel, it's set to 100% wet. That minus 18 gain has been recalled. And let's see how this sounds. So we will just play this one over here. I'm gonna reorder this. And now I can use my send to determine the exact amount of reverb that I want to send out to. So, like I said, the other aspect of open air is that you can also capture impulse response for guitar cabinets, but that's not something that I'll be covering today. But once you kind of get your head wrapped around it, it's a pretty cool plugin to use. And if you have any reverb settings that you like to use on your hardware, it's really easy to just dial those in, set this up, and then just make a morning out of it, put on a coffee and capture as many impulse responses as you want. One thing I will tell you, one little tip in general that I've noticed is that when you're working on your presets, let's go back to open air for a moment and let's go over here to one of these and I'm going to click show and finder. When you're working on your presets and you want to have subfolders and you want to be able to store presets to those subfolders, in order for this folder to show up as an option, for example, this one over here, in order for this to show up as an option, you actually have to manually go into your presets, which would be in Studio One, Presets, Presonus, Open Air, create a subfolder and name it accordingly. And then it needs to have at least one preset in there already. So that's something you have to do manually before you can save your presets to subfolders. But then once you have at least one preset in there, when you choose the option to store this preset, the folder option that you created, the custom folder option will be available. And then, like I said, the advantage here is that if you're browsing from the Studio One browser and you're in your effects tab, if you click the preset name, notice that we have the description versus some presets. See, this one doesn't have a description, but this one over here, big wooden chamber, this will be splashy big hall, and then this will be small bright plate. It gives you an indication as to the description. So that's actually useful. And then in terms of just having some organization, having these subfolders in your actual presets is a nice thing as well. Anyways, that's all the time that I have available. I hope that you enjoyed this content. If you did, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Any questions or comments, leave them down below. I will do my best to get back to you. And as always, we will catch you in the next video. Cheers.